There we go. Okay, so good morning, everybody, uh, or good evening. I know for a couple of you, it might be in different places. I know Jens is in, uh, in Germany. Nice to see Jens today. Um, but uh, yeah, welcome today uh, to another session of Experience at Learn at User, um, Model Online Lessons with National Geographic Learning. And today, we have something a little special because you won't have seen this on, on our slides much before. Um, I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, but today, we're here to talk about uh, a series called the China Showcase Library, uh, and specifically, The Monkey King uh, is a book we're going to look at today, okay? So just a little bit about me, for those of you who don't know, um, I'm a teacher trainer here at National Geographic Learning. Uh, I'm based here in Asia, in Taipei, but originally I'm from New Zealand, um, and I've been teaching uh, and working in education for a long, long time, as you can see. Um, I've uh, been working in education almost my entire uh, adult working life, um, but I have had a lot of different jobs. So fun fact for today, I've had 10 different jobs uh, throughout my uh, currently 47 years. Um, my first job was when I was about 16 um, after school. But then interestingly, my second job, I used to work for a beekeeper, uh, which is also known as an apiarist. So there's your English word for the day, if you didn't know that word. Um, so yeah, I used to, I worked two summers working with bees. Um, so that was one of my jobs way back when I was a university student, right? So there you go, a little fun fact about me, just, just for entertainment value. Um, but today, uh, just again, for those of you who know this, that's okay. But if you don't, uh, you should be able to see some annotation tools. You should have a menu bar like this one, uh, probably at the top of your screen, um, unless you've moved it. And over here, we've got these annotation tools. And if you open that little, uh, as Kitty's already doing, if you open that little uh, menu, you should see this one. Uh, Kitty's currently using a stamp. She's putting hearts on the screen. I can see you just put up a star. So if you can go ahead and uh, just annotate on the screen quickly, just so I know you can use the tool. I know a lot of you have done this before. Thank you for demonstrating for everybody else. Thanks, Alice. Edward, good job. I can see your names when they pop up there. Very nice. Okay, so we've got people knowing how to do this. That's great. Let me just clean this off. Um, we won't use a lot of um, other tools today. We will use annotation. And uh, if you want to today, you'll also be able to uh, unmute and speak uh, as we're going along. Um, so we will use that because I will ask questions which you can answer in the chat box or you can unmute. Okay. Um, so we will use those uh, interactions today, but we won't use breakout rooms or some of the other features. Okay. Great. Now, today's lesson uh, comes not just from National Geographic Learning, but also from People's Education Press. Now, who, is, uh, who are People's Education Press? Um, they're based in Beijing, uh, and they, uh, we do, as many publishers do, we do co-publishing with different publishers. So um, that's when uh, a couple of publishers get together and work on a series of books together. Um, and so the series that we're doing today is uh, China Showcase Library, uh, and it is a uh, a reader's library. Um, we're just going to go in and do the lesson and see um, kind of what we can do with these kind of materials, but they are higher level uh, reader materials uh, designed for older students. Um, so not uh, for elementary school so much, uh, they are for older students. Now, just before uh, we get started and go into the lesson, I have a little poll I'd like you to do to start, just to find out a little bit about you. Um, and you should be able to see on the screen now two questions in a poll. Uh, which segments do you teach? You can choose as many as you want. And also, if you're currently teaching, do you teach your students about other cultures during English class? Okay, so if you can just go through and quickly uh, vote in the poll, that would be wonderful. And see the votes coming in. We've already got 10 people voted. Very nice. Let's just wait another 15 seconds or so, get a few more. 25, good job. Okay. So we might pause it about there. This is just an indication. Um, it's just to, just to give us a quick idea of how everyone's doing. So we can see we've got a lot of um, mix of ages here, if I share the results on the screen. Um, a mix of ages here, um, a lot of young learner teachers, but teens. Now, these uh, materials that we're talking about, today, talking about today could be good for teens, maybe for older young learners, uh, but they'd have to be good readers, okay? Uh, and definitely perhaps good for university level students. Um, and it's great to see that we're learning about other cultures in our English classes too. That's really good to see, 
Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing the results. Thanks, Katie, for typing these things in as we're going. Um, but uh, I'll stop sharing now um, with the results. Close this off. We'll clear the screen a little bit. Thank you, Kitty. And we're going to jump into our material for today. So I'm going to switch screens here. I'm going to screen share a different screen. Uh, now, today's material, just so you know, it, uh, there is no uh, equivalent to a classroom presentation tool currently for this material. So we're looking at uh, images and um, pages just in a very basic uh, presentation format. Um, and I'll explain why I did that later. And if you want to ask me about that, we can do it at the end. But let's get into the, into the lesson today. Now, on the screen, what can you see? In the chat box, or if you want to unmute, what, what can you see here? What is this? What's this picture you can see on the screen at the moment? Lanterns, this is Kitty. Monkeys, yes, we can see a lot of monkeys. Very good, lots of different monkeys here. Yeah, what else can we see? Let's move some windows out the road here. So I've got some real estate for what I need to do. Very good. Uh, a mountain. Cool. There's a mountain in the background. Some different plants. Very good. Yeah. So there's a lot of different things we can see on the screen here, but lots of monkeys. And as Kitty said, yeah, this is uh, lanterns, right? Um, in, uh, in Asia, uh, in uh, China and other parts of um, Asia, um, they use a lot of uh, lanterns, especially around Lantern Festival after Chinese New Year to... Um, share uh, ideas and, and displays and other things. Um, yeah, we've got some calligraphy here. A worm. Okay, where's the worm? Oh, I think I see. Oh, yes, I see. Someone put a heart on the worm down there. That does look like a worm, doesn't it? Very cool. Okay, let me scroll up a little bit here. I'm just going to move up the page. Okay, who's this? Who's this larger fellow up here? Giant it is now. Giant guy in red. Is it a guy? The Monkey King? It's the Monkey King, yes. It is the Monkey King. He is the king of the monkeys. Now, so what do we know about the Monkey King? Does anyone know anything before we start looking at the book today about the Monkey King? Yeah? Is this me, says Joanna? It's you? No, I don't think that's me. It has way more hair than I do. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very good. Uh, Kitty says, journey to the West. Does anyone know what Kitty means by journey to the West? Does anyone know what that means? If not, we're going to find out about it today. Okay, we've got, uh, I think, is that a name? Yuri's typed in yeah, name. Okay. That's the name okay. of the monkey. Ah, very nice, cool. So you know, you know a name. Uh, and there, and uh, to be honest, he does have several different names. Um, depending on, uh, he, he named himself several different things. Does anyone know anything else? Has anyone seen the Monkey King anywhere else before? Yeah, there we go. There's some other, the other names. Theater. Sorry, what, what was that? I missed that. Um, it's an imaginary figure, and we just, uh, um, you really watch it when we were a little child. Yeah, just so where did you watch it? Um, yeah, exactly. On the movies, right? Yeah, or... Um, in other places, he's a very popular character, right? He's like a Chinese superhero, as the title says. I remember first seeing the Monkey King when I was, I think, around about grade six or grade seven uh, in New Zealand on television. There was a TV show uh, called The Monkey King or Monkey Magic, I think it was called. Um, and yeah, lots of great martial arts. Um, as um, Luisito says, yeah, martial, he, he does a lot of martial arts. Um, and yeah, Gloria, as Gloria said, accompanied uh, Chuanzan to India. Okay, now we're going to find out about that today, right? So let's take a little bit of a look at the beginning of the book here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move over. What you can see is I'm just using pages from the book as my images today. So I'm going to move down here a little bit. I've got too many windows in the road, sorry. And I'm going to clear off those annotations there. Let's get rid of all those. Okay. So before we get started into the reading, we've got a few words we want to look at here. So we can see four words here. So what's the first word? On, on audio, who can pronounce that word for me? What word is that? Number one. Does anyone know that word? Okay, this one is grotto. Grotto, a grotto. Okay, and it says here a cave, especially one made by people. Okay, so where do you think you would find a grotto? 
where do you think you would find a grotto? If you want to type in the chat box. Where, yeah, maybe it could be, as Francis said, in a sacred place, good, or in a mountain, true, okay? So grottos are caves, usually in mountains or cliffs or something like that. And yeah, often they're associated with sacred places or maybe natural places, natural grotto, okay? Great, next one is this one here. I think you know this word, a province. Okay, so if I ask you, which province do you live in? Can you type in the chat box? Which province do you live in? Jens, I like your one, the blue grotto, the sea, very nice. Jilin says Kitty, good job. Liao Ning says Han, cool. Laguna, very cool. Rhineland, cool, Guanxi, Tarlac. Wow, we got people from all over the place, West Java. Metro Manila, nice. So you know what provinces are. I can see from what you're typing, you understand a province. Okay, next one is a monk. Now I'm pretty sure we've all seen monks, um, uh, male members of a monastery usually, or some sort of religious group, especially in Asia. I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with monks. Okay, um, and then next one, what is this one? Scripture, a scripture. So the holy writings of a religion. So can anyone give me an example of a scripture that has a name? Like uh, maybe it's a book or a piece of writing that has a name. There we go. So Yen says the Bible, right? That is a Western scripture. Great. What's another one? What else do we have? The Quran. Yeah, exactly. Right? Muslim scripture, right? Great. Any others? Often, actually, with some of the other, um, yeah, there, there we go, the trip of the Hakka, right? Very nice, right? So there's a lot of different ones. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're very large. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different types of scripture. It's great. So obviously, um, we just need to check on these words before we go into it. We want to make sure people know these words before we start the reading, okay? So great, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go down and we're gonna look at the first very small section here of the reading today. Okay, we're just going to look at this piece here. Um, actually, I'll just highlight it in red here. We're just going to look at this piece here. Okay, so I'm going to play some audio for this one. Uh, so let me see. Oh, hang on. No, this one doesn't have audio. Excuse me. So it says here, the story begins at the Ulen Grottoes near Dunhuang in China's Gansu province and then moves to Xi'an, which is the ancient capital of China. After that, the story travels back west to the Ulen Grottoes and beyond. Okay, so what, let's take a look. These are some places, right? Let's see where, where these places are. So over here, I have a map. I'm just going to move over here. I have a map over here. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little so we can see the whole map. There we go. This is from my web, my web uh, browser, so excuse all the different little words at the top there. Okay, so here we have, I need to clean my screen off. I've got too much stuff here. Go out a bit more. Here we have uh, a map of part of China. You can see um, up here, this is Beijing. Up here, down here at the bottom, this is Shanghai. Right here is Xi'an, right? Um, and over here, where the one is, this is the Ulin Grottoes. This is where they're located in China. Obviously, China is a very large place, okay? So if you look down a little bit closer here, here are, uh, here's the location of the Ulin Grottoes. So, this here I'm using the satellite view. So what is the countryside like around here? What kind of landscape is this? What kind of, uh, what does this look like? I'm pretty sure it's not a forest, right? <laughs> where, where is this? Does anyone know where, what, what, how would you describe the land around here? What would you say? Mountains? Could be, yeah. We can see there's, it looks like maybe down the bottom here, there's kind of mountains perhaps, maybe up here as well. Mountains, it looks sandy, right? Yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty dry, okay? Uh, so this is a desert. Yeah, this is in the Gobi Desert, right? Uh, in the desert in the uh, western part of China, okay? And if I go down a little bit more, um, then what you can see here, uh, this is zoomed in, and you can see here there's like a, a piece like, through here, right? This is, looks like maybe an old river or something like that. Um, and this is part of the terrain where the Ulan Grottoes are. So we're going to find out about those. Let me go back up and we'll go back across to the book here. Back over here, let me zoom back in. Okay. Okay, so up here we see the Ulan Grottoes, right? Okay, so now we're going to get down and we're gonna read uh, this paragraph down here, okay? 
Okay, now I may be mispronouncing some of the words slightly, but let's take a look here. We've got Xuanzang, uh, who was born and died in this kind of period, was a Buddhist monk in China. The Buddhist scriptures that were available in China at the time were poor translations of the originals. And so, unhappy with this situation, in 627, Xuanzang left for India, determined to study Buddhism where it started. Such a journey was not easy and it went through deserts and mountains and Xuanzang had to overcome many struggles along the way. After arriving in India, he spent many years traveling and studying. He then returned to Xi'an in 645, carrying with him classic Buddhist scriptures. He also kept a detailed record of his journey and some of the legends uh, in the popular novel, Journey to the West, are based on these. Ah, now this is what Kitty talked about before. So Journey to the West is a novel, okay? Right, okay, so we can see some things in here. So what does it mean when it says here, he was determined to study Buddhism where it started? What does that tell us? What does that tell us? Where it started. What can we get out of this? So where did Buddhism start? Yeah, the origin, right? Yeah, good. The origin of Buddhism is in India, correct? Yeah. So because he's talking about India, it's where Buddhism started. Okay, great. Okay. Now, up here it says uh, that the scriptures, now remember those are the writings, right? Available at the time were poor translations of the originals. Okay, so if something's a poor translation of the original, what, what do you think that means? What could, what could you tell me about that? Poor translations of the original, low quality. So Jens, do you mean it's like low quality paper? Or, ah, oh, misleading, good, unclear, good. Okay, mistranslation, good, yeah, very good. Okay, so yeah, it's not accurate. Wow, you guys have got a large vocabulary for students. I'm treating you as my students, right? So yeah, poor translation means it's not word for word correct, right? Um, so if I'm uh, trying to translate English into Chinese and I do a bad job or vice versa, then people don't understand what I'm saying very well, okay? Great. Now, so I think I think because of, you know, you're, you're all adults, you understand the basic idea here. Um, but how long was his journey? How long was Xuanzang's journey? If we look at uh, how long was he away from China? Can you figure that out from the passage here? Many years, that's true. <laughs> we can actually see how many. Yeah, 18, right? Because if we look at these two dates, he left for India in 627, he came back in 645, he was away for 18 years. Okay, so that was quite a long time, right? He lived to be 62 years old, and you can see 18 years of his life he was traveling around, especially in India, right? Great. Now, we've got some underlined words here, determined, overcome, struggles, classic, legends, and popular, right? So let's take a look down here. Uh, we've got a little activity here at the bottom. Uh, which words match with which descriptions? Let's see, which ones of these can we do? So maybe in the chat box, if you can write down, for example, one goes with D and two goes with C and, and whatever they, they might be. Can you figure out, or if you want to on the screen, you can draw lines between uh, the, the items. If you want to use the annotate tool, let's quickly go through and check the vocab here. Determine having a strong will. Okay, so I think these two go together. Okay, great. Okay, this is classic as a work that's been regarded as important for a long time. Good. Popular, liked by many people. Nice. Very good. Overcome to fight and win. Yeah, maybe not always to fight, but yeah, to overcome is to win in the end. Good. Yep, a legend, a story. Very good. And a struggle, something that requires much effort or energy. Very nice. We've got all the answers. Good job. Okay. So thanks, Rangini. You've got them all in there for us too. So, um, yeah, so this is one way, just get, our, get, get everybody familiar with the vocabulary um, so that we make sure we understand what it means, right? Okay, okay, great. So for sake of time, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on. Um, we'll go to the next page here, we'll just scroll across. 
Um, this book is quite a long book, just so you know. It's about 2,000 words. Uh, we're not going to get through all of it today, but we will do as much as we can, right? Uh, especially some of the activities today. Okay, so here we have a blog post written by someone, uh, and he's talking about the Monkey King, you can see here. I'm gonna skip over this a little bit uh, and just go down to the bottom. We've already talked about a couple of the questions here. We already talked about question one, have you ever heard of the Monkey King and what do you know about him? We already talked about that, right? Um, but the novel, Journey to the West, it says it's a novel. Now, does anyone know about the point of the novel? What, what is, does anyone know the Journey to the West or what do you think the novel might be about? Okay, we're going to learn more about it in the reading, but let's see, do, does anyone know, you can put in the chat box or you can speak if you wish, about what's the purpose of the novel Journey to the West? Does anyone know? Or can anyone guess, if, even if you don't know? And I think the purpose is just how to overcome all kinds of difficulties and finally Good. reach your goal. Yeah, nice, right? That, that could be a purpose, right? Um, maybe you know the book, maybe you don't, that's okay. Um, but that, is, that, is, that could be a good purpose for this kind of a novel, right? Uh, a travelogue, says Yuri. Good, yeah, it could be uh, a description of what happened, more, um, more like, uh, like fiction, sorry, nonfiction rather than fiction. I mean, if it's a novel, it's fiction, but there'll be elements of nonfiction within it probably as well, okay? Maybe it's an adventure story, says Wayu, yeah. Um, very nice, good job. So we've got some different ideas here, that's good. Just think about the purpose. And then are, do you know of other stories like Journey to the West, right? Well, maybe if we don't know about Journey to the West at the moment, um, maybe we'll skip this question and come back to it later, okay? Once we know more about Journey to the West, we can see, do we know other books like this? So let's jump uh, in and take a look at the material today, and then we'll come back and maybe answer that question later, okay? So I'm scrolling down, scrolling down because there was room for the maps on the other side. Okay, now here we have, before we look at the text here, I'm gonna take a quick look at this picture here. So in this picture here, what can you see? What can you see here? Maybe I'll zoom out a fraction. Let's make it a little bit more visible. What can we see here? Stone carvings, yep. So we've got some little monuments uh, or other things at the bottom here. Yeah, and at the top, we've got a walkway up here and the grottos, right? The little man-made caves in the side of the cliff here, right? Yeah, so this is the Ulin grottos, right? And you can see, do they look old or fairly new? Could be a temple, right? Yeah, it looks kind of old. Um, maybe, maybe for the sake of safety, maybe the walkway is new and maybe it gets replaced, right? Um, it looks like fairly modern sort of construction. But some of the other things here, especially the caves, um, the grottos, some of the other uh, features that you can see on the screen, they do look kind of old. And yeah, uh, Ping says wild. Another word that you might describe for this uh, might be this word. It could be rustic. Okay, rustic means that there is not a lot of technology or modern uh, amenities here, right? Something is rustic, it's maybe a little bit more rural, a little bit more, um, uh, you know, non-city, right? Okay, uh, is it a deserted town or settlement? Yeah, well, that's the thing. People probably used to live in this region of the grottos because it is near a river. It's like on the cliffs right beside a river, okay? Very cool. And so over here, if I just scroll over here a little bit more, here's an image. Don't worry about the words at the moment, but here's an image. So it is a little, uh, because I've zoomed in so much, it's a little bit low resolution, but what can you see in the image here? What things do you see? Yeah, we've got a monk, very nice. We've got a monk here and the circle around the monk, maybe indicating his, his religiousness, his holiness, right? Yep, the monkey king, yeah. So here we've got this monkey character in the back here, right? Very good, and a horse. Uh, the horse is carrying, yeah, it looks like a lotus, a sack. There's some other things here. Here's a cliff by the looks of it, right? Uh, he's meditating or praying, something's going on here, right? So yeah, so this is actually elements of the story we're going to look at today. So what I'm going to do, let me scroll back across. I'm going to uh, move up to the text here, but I'm also going to play the audio. 
So you can listen along. Uh, it should start up here. If the volume is not loud enough, let me know in chat box. I'll try and raise the volume. But let's have a listen here. Deep in the Gobi Desert in Gansu Province, Western China, there are two low cliffs on either side of a river. Dug into the base of these cliffs, there is a system of caves, some more than 1,300 years old, filled with Buddhist statues and wall paintings. These are the Yulin Grottoes, sister caves, to the more famous Mogao Grottoes, over 100 kilometers to the west. Entering Cave 3, which was built in the Western Xiao Dynasty, 1038 to 1227, you can see Buddhist sculptures in front of you. But if you look at the colorful paintings that cover the wall, you see in one corner the curious picture of a monk with a white horse behind him. Standing beside the horse is a monkey wearing clothes. Okay, so that was the picture we just looked at, right? We just looked at that picture. This is, if I scroll back across again, um, this picture is the one we were just talking about, okay, in the grottoes here, okay? So now there's a couple of words here. Let's just uh, check them really quickly. So we've got this word, okay, uh, and this word here, okay? So the first word is dynasty. What's a dynasty? What is a dynasty? Or some people say dynasty as well. Uh, for this one, depending, I think, a, a little bit on British or US English. Okay, does anyone, what is, what is a, a dynasty or a dynasty? A period of family rule. Yeah, usually it's family. It doesn't always have to be a direct family, but it is some, yeah, as, as Cheska says, it's some sort of political group that runs for a long time, okay? So while uh, in, in China, we've, uh, we've had the Xia dynasty, we've had the Tang dynasty, we've had other types of dynasties before, um, you could talk uh, in, for example, maybe in a Western context, you could talk about the Republican dynasty, um, uh, maybe associated um, with, uh, you know, particular presidents in the US or something like this, right? But generally speaking, it's family, right? Uh, that is generally true, okay? Nice. Now, the second one is sculptures. What are, what are sculptures? What are sculptures? What's another easier word for sculptures? Yuri, I liked your one about the House of Windsor there. That's cool. Yeah, mini, a statue, generally speaking, right? Um, or it could be, as Yuri says, a carving. Yeah. So a sculpture, we, when we sculpt something, we make it out of something else. Uh, statues and carvings are good examples. What else could you make a sculpture out of? Because I'm assuming here in the cave, they're made of stone, right? What else could you make, make a sculpture from? Wood, true. Clay, very nice. Metal, yep. What else? I think maybe when you were a child, you might have made some sculptures at the beach. Perhaps, yeah, you might have used sand, says Yuri. Ceramic, good. Wax, that's a good one. Wax. Um, I've seen people in, uh, and actually, if you go to the very northern parts of China, if you go to Harbin, for example, what do they make sculptures of in Harbin? Yeah, they make them from ice. Very cool. Yeah, you can make sculptures from cloth and silk too. That's true. I've seen people make sculptures from butter or cheese. Okay, which is maybe a little unusual. Fruit, there's another good one. Great, yeah, so sculptures. We can make sculptures with a lot of different things. Great. Okay, let's look across the page here um, to the second part here. Now, I'm going to uh, play the audio. Now, I'm, I apologize for the, uh, the Chinese speakers. A couple of these words may be mispronounced in the audio slightly. Um, you let me know if that's true. But anyway, here we go. The monk in the picture is Xuan Zhang who traveled from the then capital of China, Chang'an, modern day Xi'an, on a 19 year journey through Central Asia and India in search of Buddhist scriptures, some of which he then brought back to China. His journey was the stuff of legend and many stories were created about him and his adventures. As his journey took on this legendary quality, traveling companions were soon added a white horse, another monk with a large red beard, a man pig, and a monkey. Very good, okay. So there, we're learning a little bit more about it. Uh, we, we already know from the introduction about his travels to India, 
looking for Buddhist scriptures, right? The original Buddhist scriptures, okay? Um, are there any words in here that you're not sure about? Any things you're not sure about? Any particular words that you want me to go over very quickly before we move on? Or are we pretty happy? I'll give you a few seconds. Because you're adults, I think you're happy, right? I think you know these ones. Okay. Uh, but maybe our students might ask about, for example, this word legendary or this word companions, right? And uh, what else? The stuff of legend, for example, right? So the people, the students might ask about these, always just be prepared to answer those questions if they come up. Great. Okay. So what we'll do is we're moving on through the rest of the story. Here you can see, here's the descriptions on the page for dynasty and sculpture. Um, but we talked about those separately already. Let's scroll down a little bit more. Look at the next page here. Now, before we go to the next page, I want to pre-teach you a little bit of vocabulary or some phrases that are on the next page, okay? Um, so here we've got the phrase, a great classic of some sort of literature. So for example, we could say a great classic of Indian cultural adjective, right, literature or a great uh, classic of Native American, actually Native Americans don't really have literature um, because they didn't have a written language, right? Maybe we could say Greek culture, uh, Greek literature, for example. Okay, what does that mean? If something is a great classic of somewhere's literature, what's, what, how, how else could we describe that? What's the simpler words we could use for the same thing? What else could we say? A masterpiece? Okay, it could be. We could say it's famous. There we go. Okay, so we could say a famous. Um, now I'm going to use Greek just to use a word. Okay, or it could be Chinese or it could be anything. Um, literature, what's a simpler word we could use instead of literature? A writing. Yeah, that would do. Good. Okay, so famous Greek writing. It could be a book, it could be a poem, it could be a play. Could be something like that, right? But it's, yeah, some sort of writing. So that's a way to simplify that phrase. Okay, now the next one says, in a sense like. So if I say one is in a sense like two, I'm comparing two things, right? What, what does in a sense like mean? In a sense like. Similar to. Okay, so there's a good, there's a good uh, general phrase. It's similar to. Now, if I said how similar, is it very similar, somewhat similar, a little similar? Um, what do you think? How, how strong is the degree here in a sense like? What would you think? To some extent, that's a good one, Ping, yeah. Somewhat, yeah. So it's not very similar right? It's a little bit similar. It's somewhat similar, right? So it's at the lower end of the scale. So maybe somewhere from zero to five, um, but not as high as 10. We're not going that high, right? Um, so we're in the lower probably range of similarity, okay? Um, some students relate well to math, so numbers can be good. Okay, next one. Something is grounded in something. Now, this is another one where we can do a comparison. If Something is grounded in something else. Okay, Yen says its roots are in, it is based on, very good. Okay, so we could say is based on, good. Okay, very good, it's rooted in, it's based on, nice. Okay, that's good. Okay, next one, flights of fancy. What does, what does this one mean? Does anyone know what this one means? Imaginative, yeah, okay, a flight of fancy. Uh, it's, it's almost a very British sounding phrase, phrase to me, but a flight of fancy means it's, it's, you're using your imagination, right? Okay, um, a flight of fancy means you're, you're kind of going away with the fairies or something like that, as they say. Um, you're, you're being imaginative, you're making stuff up, right? It's, it's not true, okay? Um, so, for example, I could say, um, do you have friends or are there some people you know who engage in flights of fancy. Mm -hmm. They engage in storytelling and using their imagination a lot. Okay. I could say, actually, my daughter does that a bit. <laughs> she makes stuff up all the time, tells these crazy stories. Um, so I could say she engages in flights of fancy when she's telling crazy stories. Okay. Okay. And then the last one, uh, usually we talk about a person and we say, 
uh, this person is a little slow. What do we mean by that? If someone is a little slow, is it like little slow, right? <laughs> but what does this one mean? Any ideas? Not too bright. Yes, true, right? So when we say a little slow in this way, we're meaning the way that they think. They think slowly. Maybe they're not too smart. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I could say um, people, because my father finished, my, my own father uh, left school uh, before he was 16 years old. I'd say he was a little slow at school, but actually he's quite smart. He's, he's a mechanical engineer and he, uh, he does a lot of um, really fun and interesting things with mechanics and engineering, right? So he's not slow at all. Although maybe his school teachers thought he was a little slow. Okay, good, yeah. So May, actually tardy would not be the, the way that we would use this phrase. We're not talking about physical slowness here. We're talking about mental slowness. Okay, so this is exactly, and May's just given us the perfect example, thank you, May, of where sometimes the reason we go through these vocabulary points with students um, is to make sure they have the right idea and they're not confusing these things for something else because that affects their understanding of the reading and the story and so on that's coming up, okay? So if our students know all these things, like most of you uh, knew all these pretty quickly, great, we can move on. But if not, we have to make sure our students know what these phrases and things are, perhaps before we go into this part of the reading, okay? Good job. Thank you, May, for a good example there. Good job. Okay, so a moron. Yeah, actually, <laughs> just before we move on, a moron. If someone's a moron, um, yeah, that, that maybe has a different connotation. We might say they're more than a little slow. They're like stupid, right? Um, if someone's a little slow, it's innocent. Right. If someone's a moron, um, then we might say, yeah, that's raising the scale on stupidity a little bit. Right. Um, moron's not a nice word. Don't go calling people a moron. OK. <laughs> OK. Very good. OK. Now, down here, next piece. Uh, we're just going to read through this one quickly. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little so we can see the whole whole uh, text on the page here. There we go. Oh, it's hard to control. Okay, <laughs> I can't quite get it exactly right. Here we go. Okay, so let's quickly read through this. I will read it out loud very quickly, uh, and then we'll, we'll summarize it at the end. Okay, so during the Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644, many of these stories were put together in what became one of the great classics of Chinese literature, Journey to the West. In this novel, Xuanzang was given the title Tang Sanzang, and he makes a journey through Western China to Xitian, Western heaven, accompanied by his white horse, Monk Sha, Pigsy, and the Monkey King. Uh, Tang Sanzang is serious and determined, in a sense like the real life Xuanzang. But while Tang Sanzang is grounded in real life, the other main characters are all based on flights of fancy. For example, in this story, the white horse is really a dragon who has changed himself into a horse, to a white horse, in order to carry Tang Sanzang to Xitian. Uh, though loyal and good, for the most part, the white horse never speaks. Meng Xia and Pigsy are both bodyguards for Tang Sanzang. San San sorry. Uh, though Meng Xia is a little slow and does not speak much, he has a kind heart. Pigsy, on the other hand, is lazy and a lover of food and women, and he sometimes gets himself and the rest of the group into trouble. However, the main character in the book is the Monkey King. Okay. Right. So if you were to summarize what we talked about, what, I, what we just went over in the reading there, what could you, what's one or two things you could quickly say to summarize some of the points from those two paragraphs? What, could we do what was that? Sorry, I missed that. Sorry. Oh, no, maybe not. So what could we say about the characters or what could we say? Okay, so we're, yeah, good, Jessica. We're talking about the main characters and how many are there? How many main characters are there? There are four, right? So we could say here we're learning about the four main characters, okay? Uh, I think, yeah, there's four because there's Tang San Zhang, 
Monkey King. Oh, there's five. Sorry, there's the horse. I forgot the horse. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot the horse. Okay. So yeah, there are the four. You can see them on the screen here, actually, if I just scroll across so we can see Mount Shah here over on the side. Then yeah, I forgot the horse. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Kitty has put the Chinese names in there for us. Thank you very much, Kitty. More than I expected. Okay, this is an English lesson. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, the five, we're introducing the five main characters in the story. Okay, what else does this paragraph talk about? Here. So it talks a little bit about how the book, The Journey to the West, came about, right? And how it's based on the journeys of um, uh, Xuanzang, right? Okay. Uh, the horse is not the main character in the whole story. Yeah, that's potentially true. Although I think he does get ridden everywhere. So he's kind of always there. Okay, very good. So yeah, this one talked a little bit about uh, the book, how it's based on the this kind of a real story, but how it is really fiction. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a biography, right? It is, it is a piece of fiction. Okay? Uh, it also tells us when the story was written. Now, who remembers how... When is this compared to when Xuanzang was actually traveling to India? Do you remember from the last page? When was when was Xuanzang traveling to India? That was around what was it, around 650 or 640 or somewhere around there. So this is almost like at least six, seven, eight hundred years later, right? Here we go. Thanks, thanks, uh, Minnie. Very nice. So. Yeah, I was a little bit late, maybe 6.30, right? Um, but yeah, it's like 700, 800, 900 years later that these stories were put down, okay? Very nice, okay? Good job. Okay, so having summarized that, let's go down. I'm gonna do, uh, just to show you, there's nothing else on this particular page here. Um, we're gonna scroll down. Now, I have uh, some questions for you because for the next part, I want you to read the page, okay? And then we're gonna try and get you to answer these questions, right? I'm not gonna read the page out. You're gonna read it by yourself. So let's see, question one is, how old is the Monkey King? Number two is, when? Did, uh, why did he leave his home? Number three is, what is his other name? And you might have seen it in the chat box already. Uh, number four, what does he hide in his ear? And I'll give you a hint, it's not a banana. Uh, and why is he immortal? Okay, what does immortal mean? Let's just check that everybody knows this word. What is immortal? If you are immortal, then what does that mean? What does it mean if you're immortal? You cannot die, you live forever, correct. Okay, very good. Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, scroll out a little here so we can see all of the pages when we come down. So please try and find the answers to these five questions. As you look through the page, um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, right? I know it'll take you a little time to read. So here we go. At your own pace, here's the two pages. So please just read to yourself and try and find the answers to the questions, okay? I will put the questions in the chat box so you can see them again. Oh, thank you, Kitty. Kitty's already done it. So this kind of activity is a good way for students to individually read their way through, right? And look for meaning. But maybe they're not reading very deeply. Maybe they're just looking for the answers to the questions you gave. So I'll give you, just, just for the sake of time, I'll give you about one more minute and then we'll quickly go over the answers together, okay? Ah, we're getting some answers coming in already. Okay, so 30 seconds.
Okay, so let's take a quick look at the questions and let's try and go through them all really quickly here. So how old is the Monkey King? We've got a few answers. Uh, we've got more than 1300 years old because I know you're looking at this phrase, more than 1300 years old, right? Um, hundreds of years, says Huelin, right? Um, any, any other thoughts on the first question? How old is the Monkey King? Okay, so Li Chen, what you said is actually something else uh, not quite related to, that's how his age or how old he becomes later. But in terms of our history, how old is the character of the Monkey King, right? Now it says here, it says stories about him more than 1300 years old, but up at the top here, it's, it says it's not really known when they first began, right? This reference is in terms of um, maybe if it was based on a real life student, of Xuanzang's, um, then that would make the character about 1300 years old, but we don't really know. Um, that it's, it's not really known how old the character is, but it does say it's got to be at least as old as, this, as the painting in the grottos, right? Which has been dated back about 1000 years, right? Okay, great. Number two was, why did he leave his home? Why did he leave his home? So uh, Huilin said again, he wanted to know how to live forever. Yeah, so if we look down here, it says after several hundred years, wow, he's already old, he became unhappy because he knew the monkeys would die. So he decided to search the world about how to become an immortal and a sage. Yeah, he wanted to live forever and he wanted to learn a lot of things. Great, okay, good job. Okay, number three was what is his other name? So I think we've figured this out. Here we can see he gained the Buddhist name, uh, Sun Wukong. Uh, he actually has a couple of other names as well. Uh, I believe the Great Sage is another one of his names. Um, but yeah, he has a few different names. Uh, and someone mentioned uh, another one earlier today, which I've forgotten, I'm, I'm sorry, but someone already mentioned a different one in the chat box, okay? Uh, number four, what does he hide in his ear? What does he hide in his ear? It's at the bottom of the first page. A needle? No, it's not a needle, actually. It says he could shrink it to the size of a needle, but what is it? Yeah, there we go. A staff with gold bands on either end. And he can make this any size. He can make it big, he can make it small, right? Why do you think, question, why do you think he hides his staff in his ear? Why does he do that? Why, why does he hide it in his ear? So it's easy to carry, that could be true, Kitty, good. It's a secret weapon, yes, that's good, Rangini. So people don't know he's got it, can't easily be seen, right? Okay, I, I kind of wonder if he would forget it, if he didn't like put it somewhere where it couldn't, couldn't be lost, right? So he hides it in his ear, so yeah, no one can steal it, but also he can't lose it, maybe. The Monkey King is, yeah, he's, he's not the most reliable character sometimes. Okay, and then the last one is why is he immortal? And so uh, Huilin again said, uh, he crossed his names out in the book of death, right? Um, so it says up here, uh, he forced the 10 kings of the world of darkness to open the book of life and death so that he could find his name. And when he saw he got angry, he crossed out his name and then he crossed out all the other monkey names as well. Um, so yeah, monkeys, monkeys, well, his friends at least became immortal, okay? And then now that he's immortal, he can fight his way out of the world of darkness because no one can kill him. Okay, right? So yeah, so he's, he's, a, he's a bit of a character as the Monkey King. Okay, great. Now we're running out of time a little bit, but what I think we'll do just to wrap up here, obviously we're not gonna get through the rest of the book, but let's just scan through here and see what's in the rest of the book here. Um, so we learn here about how uh, the Monkey King becomes um, the stable master in heaven. Uh, the keeper of the horses of heaven um, and how that's a little bit of a trick and he rebels against uh, the Jade Emperor who's the king of heaven um, so yeah and he fought the heavenly armies with his with his staff uh, and then later on down here it says um, he was put in a prison in a furnace and then he escaped uh, and he came up and he had a special power where is it um, yeah he, he now has a special power 
that allows him to recognize demons who are disguised as humans. Um, we could get into a discussion with our students as if you had a power, what power would you like to have, right? We could, we could discuss that kind of idea with our students, right? Okay, what else did he get up to down here? Um, he wanted, uh, okay, he want, the Jade Emperor calls on Buddha to help. Um, and Sun Wukong thinks that he can beat Buddha, but turns out he can't. Um, Buddha, Buddha beats uh, the monkey. Uh, the monkey king buddha uh, monkey king tries to leave buddha's hand which is the universe but he can't get past buddha's fingers uh, so yeah so we learn more about this uh, and then he makes a deal uh, as we can see down here uh, buddha makes a deal so that he could be set free uh, sun wukong the monkey king he could be set free from the prison if he would promise to help sun uh, tan san zang reach xi tian and then go on his journey right through um through India. And so that is how the character of the Monkey King comes to join uh, Tang San Zang and, and comes into the journey of the West books. Okay, great. And it also talks here about how the Monkey King has a gold band around his head and also uh, how that was used to control the Monkey King. Okay, very good. Ah, very good. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, uh, Hua Lin's te some, teaching us something else. He behaved like this because he had no parents to teach him right and wrong. That's true. The Monkey King was not born from a monkey parent. The Monkey King was born from a stone. <laughs> so if you look back in the, in the story, you'll find out how he's born as well. Okay, um, so let's just wrap up. There's a lot more about his stories, about Pigsy and, and Monk Shan, about the other things they get up to. But then it also talks a little bit about how the Monkey King is revered in Chinese culture, especially by kids. Kids love the Monkey King. Um, I loved the Monkey King when I was a kid. Um, and he's also featured in stage plays and other things. You can see this book, there's a lot of information in this book that our students can learn, okay? But I thought what we'd finish with today is just to take a look at this activity down here, uh, activity B. Now let's see if we know what some of the words are that might fill in about the different characters here. So this activity here, if I just scroll up a fraction, it says complete the character profiles. So without looking back, um, Tang San Zhang, based on the real life person, perhaps, serious and what's a word um, that we may remember that we might be able to put in here? Determined, I love that word, thank you very much. Let's put that one in here. He's determined, great. Okay, the Monkey King, uh, Sun Wukong, nicknames, the Monkey King, the what? I mentioned it, we didn't read it, but I mentioned it. Uh, heaven's equal because he beat the Jade Emperor. Um, I'll give you a clue. It's two words. Yeah, there we go. The Great Sage. Very nice. That's mentioned in the book. Okay. Has a magic staff and a gold band. Um, what goes here? And a gold band. What do we think goes in this next one for number three? Gold. Well, the staff is mentioned here. So the gold band is different. Right, he has a gold band like headpiece, maybe. I'll use the word headpiece. Um, like it goes around his head, right? Uh, like a circlet or something like that could be, could be used to describe that as well. Great. Uh, brave, loyal and good-hearted and righteous. Okay, Pigsy, a man pig is what and a lover of what? Lazy, good. So Pigsy is lazy, great. And a lover of what? What does he love? Women, yes. If you look back at the, and also food. Um, if you look back at the story of Pigsy, uh, you find out he was a man who got turned into a pig because he was chasing the women too much uh, in, in the court, okay? Um, Monk Shah has a large, you can see it in the picture, a large red beard. Yeah, he's got a large red beard, okay? Um, a little slow, et cetera, et cetera. The right horse is really, really a what? Really a dragon, great, okay? Changed itself into a horse to carry Sun Sun Sun. Uh, loyal and good, almost never what? Almost never starts with S, ends with peaks, almost never speaks. Okay, <laughs> good job. Okay, if you learn about the dragon as well, why, uh, why did the dragon turn itself into a horse? Apparently the dragon ate a horse and then found out it was the horse of of Tang San Zhang and felt guilty, so turned itself into a horse so that the monk would still have a horse, okay? So there we go, okay? Great, so that's a little bit about uh, this book. You can see if I scroll back out here, let me just show you uh, kind of the, the, the page overviews. So if I go right back to the top, 
way back up to here. So in the beginning of the book, we have some pre-reading work that we can do before we read. Uh, as we go through the details of the, the story, um, it's got the audio. We listen to a little of the audio as we go. We've got the vocabulary call-outs. Um, we can check the, the more difficult words as we're going, okay? Um, lots of good imagery in the book here as well, lots of art, uh, of course. Um, at the bottom, uh, as we were just looking at, we've got uh, different review questions and things like that as well. And it also talks here, because we're talking about Journey to the West as one of the classics uh, of Chinese literature, here are the other three considered China's four great classics. Um, so it could be a way that students could relate to these books and we could talk about now are there similar books in your own culture, okay, uh, to these four uh, Chinese classics, okay? Uh, and finally, at the bottom, uh, because this is a fairly high level book, uh, it also refers to all the, um, the words that uh, relate to uh, the vocabulary lists and things like the academic word list and things like this as well. Uh, reading is a really great way to develop vocabulary in context, okay? So uh, again, the word lists are in the back here with page reference. Um, so this is a great little book, right? Um, and it's part of a series. Uh, I'm just going to switch screens back again, jump back to the PowerPoint here. Uh, this is from um, the China Showcase Library series, uh, which is a series of readers from the intermediate level to the advanced level from B1 to C1. Uh, Monkey King is around B2, okay? So it's in the middle of the range. Um, and it's really, the series as higher level readers are, it's really a reading to learn kind of series. You're not learning to read anymore. You're really reading to learn new ideas, okay? Uh, while you develop your English skills as well. And in this series, there's a lot of great topics about the people, places, culture, technology, myths and legends, um, and all sorts of things about uh, uh, China, okay? Uh, China has a very, very long history. It's one of the um, three, uh, sorry, one of the four great ancient cultures, uh, Chinese culture together with uh, the Egyptian culture, the, um, the Mesoamerican culture and the Mesopotamian culture. Um, so China has a lot of history to explore, right? Um, as I mentioned, it's got lots of, whoops, excuse me. It's got lots of uh, great activities to do before and after uh, and while you read and there's audio that goes with the book as well, okay? Um, so what I'd like to do is just open up to any questions uh, today about the book or about any of the activities we did. And also I'll throw up a little poll here as well. Um, just if you'd like to find out more about uh, the series, if you put a yes into this little poll, um, then I will send your information on to um, the uh, local National Geographic Learning team and they'll get back in touch with you um, with some more examples of the books. Uh, I can also, if I just grab the website page, if you want to explore it by yourself, um, the web link I've just put in the chat box will take you to our website that has uh, information about the books there as well. Okay, great. So does anyone have any questions? You can put them in the chat box or come off audio uh, and let me know of any questions you might have. How are we doing for time? We're almost at 11, that's good. Any questions at all? Are we pretty happy? Most people seem pretty happy, I think. Thanks, this was fun, good. <laughs> it's enjoyable. I think maybe one thing today, you can see, I haven't used a, a fancy presentation tool for doing this kind of session. Um, it's just, how do you use the pages of the book? I'm doing it digitally. I mean, if you had the physical books, what would you do to try and uh, guide your students through the book, to help them learn vocabulary, to make them read ahead, to do these sorts of things, yeah. Yeah, Lorenzo, um, by, by getting this material, do you mean the PowerPoint or do you mean the books themselves? Um, if it's the books, um, we can get you in touch with the team who can get you copies of the, of the books, okay? Great. Will we feature another culture next time? Actually, today we're focusing on this one. Um, actually, our next webinar, um, I didn't put the photo in, sorry, but the next one uh, actually, uh, Cheska, is about entertainment. Um, Will uh, will be back for our next webinar, and he's going to be talking about entertainment um, through another one of our series. So um, you'll get an email about that tomorrow uh, with the link to go and check out Will's webinar next week. Um, so I guess if entertainment culture is of interest to you, you can check that one out as well. Okay, very good. 
Okay, nice, Jens. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, it is good to learn about other cultures, right? I mean, I even me, I learned just by reading the reader. I learned a few new things just by reading the reader, and I know some things about the Monkey King already, right? Good job. Okay, well, we'll thanks, everybody. I'm going to close the poll here. Um, we'll wrap it up. Um, if you want to head away, thank you very much. Um, do remember that tomorrow we will send you the recording link, uh, the follow-up survey and the certificate. Um, Will's webinar is coming up. Be a fan. Um, join us on WeChat or Facebook. Um, and I will hang around. Now, if you do have, if you think of a couple of questions, um, I'll, I'll hang around for another 15 minutes or so. We can chat a little bit more. Um, thank you, Kitty, for putting in the registration link. That's for Will's next webinar. Thank you very much, Kitty. And uh, yeah, keep in touch. Let us know what else you would like to learn about. And uh, we can keep, um, yeah. Oh, you have trouble getting in, Yuri. If you need to, um, yeah, I'll send, well, I'll send you an email, perhaps. We can chat about it, make sure you can get in okay. Okay. Thanks, Rangini. Nice to know it's, nice to know it's useful. <laughs> Very good. So like I say, I'll stay around here for a little bit longer if you have questions, but if not, enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you next week. Thank you very much all. Thanks Cherry, thanks Gloria, thanks Han, thanks Anjali. Thanks Marie. Uh, so Cheska, the certificate, um, you'll get an email tomorrow. Uh, it'll probably come out around lunchtime uh, or thereabouts, which uh, will have uh, two things. It has the recording link and it has a short survey, just like five questions. And at the bottom of the survey is the download for the certificate. Now, if you don't get the email or you can't find it or something, just reply back um, to any of the other emails you've received from us. And eventually your email will get to me and then I will send you the certificate. Okay. Ah, uh, Yuri. Okay, I understand. Okay. Right. So Yuri, um, yeah, we'll we'll figure out a way to get you in for that. That's okay. Good job, Cheska. Thank you. Till the next webinar, Roderick. True. <laughs> same Nat Geo learning time, same Nat Geo learning channel. <laughs> Excuse me, Andrew, can I ask you something? Yes, of course you may. Okay. Um, uh, first, I'd like to thank you for the great presentation, but uh, I just want to know how can we decide what's the best uh, reading topics or the most suitable reading topics for our students? Mm. Uh, we know yep. that um, it is very difficult to encourage students to read. Now, um, yep. Can you tell tell me or tell us here well, what kind of reading materials that can cater for the students' needs? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, the, there's a couple of good, actually there's a really good um, webinar uh, and kind of, uh, it's an article with a webinar attached that I'm actually sending um, out to you all. Uh, it'll come out Thursday, Friday. Um, which uh, one of our editors, Sean Birmingham, has a nice little article about choosing the right kind of material for students to read, okay? Now, I won't go into the whole thing because you'll be able to read it by yourself later and watch a webinar um, recording about that if you wish as well. That will come to you, like I say, maybe Friday. I think you'll get that email. Um, it's one of the follow-ups, but generally speaking, uh, one thing is students get discouraged from reading if the reading is either way too easy or too hard, right? So one thing is choosing the right kind of vocabulary and language level in the materials for the students. But the second thing is the topic needs to be a little bit interesting for the students, right? Um, because you give, me, you give me a book about um, French art, for example, I don't care, right? <laughs> I don't care anything about French art, but you give me a book about um, maybe something to do with science and technology, oh, I'm, I'm really interested personally in those things. So students will have their own interests and they will naturally want to read about those things. So in a class setting, when you've got a lot of students, then um, if you're lucky enough to be able to have all of your students wanting to learn about something, then that can give you suggestions for what kind of reading material, right? 
Um, but then the other side is, it's like, I have reading material, I'm kind of told I have to teach this, how do I make my students more interested in it, given that you kind of have to read it, right? That's usually the challenge that we have. And so with that, like, um, for example, today, um, maybe you're not that interested in the Monkey King, but maybe because I'm giving you some information about the history, I'm using other pictures and images like the maps, where is this, right? Um, talking about some of the history behind something, um, using a lot of photos, images, um, and something maybe that's a little unusual that relates to your topic, right? Um, like you'll see some good examples actually next week when Will uh, talks about entertainment. There will be some unusual entertainment examples and that's the way to kind of draw people into the idea a little bit, right? Um, but yeah, sometimes we need to um, look at things which are kind of common in a more unusual way to get the kids like, oh, what's this? What, what is this thing we're looking at? To catch their attention, right? Um, and that's one thing we try to do in a lot of our materials is present the usual in an unusual way to make students more interested and engaged in what they're doing. But also, if students are able to talk about something and show how it relates to their situation, um, so here today we did we looked at for example journey of journey uh, to the west we didn't actually read the book but we were learning a little about it but maybe you can make students interested in finding out more about that book by saying well do you know of other books that you've read like this is harry potter kind of like journey to the west or not right okay what's a what's a book that or what's a tv series that might be like journey to the west is it is it like game of thrones have you seen game of thrones is it kind of like that or Right, you can try and relate it to other things in the students' lives and building those connections can make them more interested as well, okay? So, yeah, I mean, the, the challenge is always having material that's like at the right language level, but then after that, it's trying to make the kids a little bit more engaged and interested in that so that they kind of want to read, okay? Um, I think the last thing would be with younger kids, um, I've taught a lot of younger kids in the past as well. Sometimes we trick younger kids into reading a little bit more. Like today I said, okay, here's five questions, read and try and find the answers. That's a little bit of like tricking you into reading a little bit, right? Because it's like a competition or a race. Um, for younger students, then maybe we trick them a little, right? Um, but older students, we want to try and build their own motivation to read, okay? By engaging them or, or something like this with, with the topic. Okay, so does that does that kind of help? Does that give you a couple of ideas? Jessica's uh, also put in Jessica's also put in the chat box there proper rewarding. Yeah, rewards and motivation uh, outside of the book uh, are good tools. Um, but if we can get the kids interested, like to a certain level, engaged in the topic, that helps a little bit as well. Okay, does that help? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. That's okay. And then also, like I say, in a couple of days, check out the email um, that uh, references Sean Birmingham. Um, he's one of our editors and he has a lot of great ideas about what's motivating for students and engaging for students in reading. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. Lorenzo, if you're still here, the next webinar is Wednesday next week. You'll get a link in your email for that again tomorrow. So you can register for the next one. Any other questions, any other comments, thoughts, anything like that? I know some of you are just kind of listening to see what other people say and catch some more tidbits of information perhaps, I know. <laughs> but if you've got your own questions, feel free. That's what we're here for, right? We're pretty happy. That's good. Thank you, Jessica. Nice to see you again, Cherry. We're, we, you're, you're becoming one of the old hands here, Cherry, as they say. <laughs> you're, you're always here. <laughs> yeah, there's a recording for this one. I've been recording, right? Uh, I haven't stopped yet. I will stop when we finish and then uh, the recording will get sent out tomorrow as well. Nice. Good. Yeah, thanks, Cherry. Nice to hear that you got those materials. Good one. Ah, yes, Yasmin, very nice, in Pakistan, nice to see you.
right? Very good. So yeah, do keep in touch, right? And and we can we can keep learning more, helping you more together for whatever you need, right? Yeah. So why you um, the recording of this session will come out in the in the email you will get tomorrow. Uh, you'll get an email tomorrow around lunchtime uh, or early afternoon. It will have a link where you can see the recording and you can also download it if you wish as well. Okay. Good job. Okay. Yeah. So will will next week for those of you still here. Will is going to be in a topic about entertainment. Uh, it's again for um, teens or or higher level students a little bit. Uh, yes, Lorenzo. I will just note that down. Um, so I will send you. Let me just copy paste that right now. So I'm not going to lose it. Where should I paste it? Uh, actually, let me just paste it here somewhere. Ah, I've lost my page. Oh, there it is. Let me just paste it there. Lorenzo, I'll send you an email later. Okay. Very nice. Okay, well, thanks everyone. I think we'll wrap it up here. But um, if you do have questions, feel free to uh, drop us an email. Um, you can reply to the emails you'll get over the next couple of days and uh, the ones uh, they'll come back through the email system to us here. Um, so please, yeah, please uh, get in touch if you have questions about anything. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.